Thank you. What is he known for? Yes, 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 yes. Here's the deal. He's a protester, civil rights activist, and educator. Some cool facts about him. So spurring from Michael Brown's death and subsequent protests, DeRay joined efforts to address mass incarceration and police killings. Fortune magazine, get this, named him 2015 50 World's Greatest Leaders. And in February, he announced that he was running for mayor in Baltimore, and he, <laughs> exactly, shout out, thanks for the support, and he finished sixth in the Democratic Party primary on April 6th. So let's give him the warm welcome that we've been giving everyone as he comes up and gives us some inspiration. Good to see you again. Thank you, yeah. It's an honor to be here today talking to you in a time where so many of our lives are under siege, where there's so much happening in this country, where so many things seem to be things worthy of protest. I'm from Baltimore, right down the street from, from Philadelphia. Both of my parents were addicted to drugs growing up. My mother left when I was three. My father raised us. And I talk about that because in so many ways, I grew up in a community of recovery. I grew up seeing people put their lives back together when they didn't think that they could. I, see com I, I grew up seeing communities come back together in ways that they didn't know was possible. I'll never forget walking down the stairs in high school and seeing my father counseling somebody that went to high school with my sister who was addicted himself. And I think about this because in so many ways it helped me understand that we are more than our pain, that we have been through so much as a people, that we've overcome so much, but that the joy that we have in the the promise of our lives is really how we define what we can do, that we are so much more than our pain. I think about two years ago on August 16th, 2014, I was sitting on my couch in Minneapolis, and it was one o'clock in the morning, and I was watching the news, and I saw what was happening on Twitter as well, and it was Ferguson. Mike Brown got killed on August 9th. His body lay in the street for four and a half hours. I saw it on the news, and I said, I'm gonna go. I got in the car, I drove nine hours. I didn't know anybody in the state of Missouri. I put a Facebook status up that said, I'm gonna go. And if you know anybody whose couch I can sleep on, let me know. I drove, seven hours in, I got a phone call from a friend and she found somewhere for me to sleep in St. Louis and that was the beginning of the protest for me. Back then I had about 800 followers on Twitter. I have about 675,000 now. So it's been a, a, a very different world. But in so many ways, we spent the last two years sort of pushing people to understand these issues differently. That when I think about protest, I think about protest at its root is this idea of telling the truth in public. That what we did is we used our bodies to tell the truth that Mike and Rakia and Ayana and Tamir and so many people should be alive. That we used our voices and our bodies to disrupt board meetings and commissions to tell the truth that they weren't using their institutional power in ways that benefited the lives of people of color. That when I think about so much of this, that people of color, we've always faced these issues of erasure, and erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either our story is never told or is told by everybody but us. And in this moment, we became the unerased, that we became the people able to tell our stories in real time using Twitter and Facebook and Instagram in ways that people never could do before. I'm mindful that we aren't born woke, that something wakes us up, and that for so many people, it was a tweet or it was an Instagram post or it was a Facebook post that woke them up. I think about when Beyonce followed me on Twitter as like a moment that we were able to push people and help use things like that to help people see that this is a real problem for people. Now, when I think about what comes next, I'm reminded of President Obama. In the last two meetings we had with him when he was president, the last one was four hours, and it was a long four hours. It was like three hours in. I'm like, are there cookies? Is there water? Like, President Obama, what's up? But it was a good meeting, and you know, what he will always say, if any of you have talked to him, is that he will always remind you that we are better off than we were before. Like he always talks about this notion of progress. The challenge with progress is that the reality of the words does not always match up with the reality of our lives. That for so many of us, we've seen the police inflict damage in people's lives. We think about the Muslim ban that just happened. That they're real things that challenge our notion of what progress looks like. And we have to be mindful that when people talk about history, they often talk about actions and deeds as if they were so long ago. But it was not so long ago that a white man walked into a black church and killed nine black people as they prayed to their God. 
It wasn't too long ago that black bodies swung from trees as strange fruit. It wasn't too long ago that we think about the history of slavery and its impact on our country. You think about cities like Montgomery, you think about Commerce Street is one of the main streets in downtown. And it's called Commerce Street because that is where the slaves were marched down as the first commerce in this country. And they ended up in Market Street, and it's named Market Street because that's where the slave market was held. That this is not the far distant past, but so much of the past still has bearing on how we think about today. And that really, this is a conversation about ideas. That the actions can change over time, but the ideas have remained the same. So whether you call it the KKK, or call it the White Citizens Council, or call it the alt-right, it's the same idea. And so much of this has to be us fighting about the right ideas. Now, some advice that I'll offer, the first is that you can't ever forget to imagine that part of what trauma does is that trauma either takes away your power or makes you feel powerless when you have power. And what you have to do in resistance, resistance is not only a set of actions, but it's a mindset. And that you have to remember to dream, and you have to remember to imagine that part of the onslaught of trauma is to convince you that you have no options, but you always have options. And as the youngest people in our democracy, I think you are the most imaginative people we have. The people who are willing to put everything on the line to fight for what you know is right. I would assume that many of you have been to a protest over the last two years, and if you've been to a protest, you've seen an incredible community come together of people saying that they know what's right. The second piece of advice is never stop fighting. That if you think that people have the answer, they don't have it. I've been in a lot of rooms all across the country talking to incredible people. I think about our meetings with President Obama. I think about people like Gaga, Beyonce, Solange, so many people who have a lot of influence and a lot of power and everybody is looking for how to, how to make a way through this. And nobody has a silver bullet, nobody has the perfect answer and that leaves a lot of space for you to do incredible work. And the last thing I'll say is that you already have permission that I find so many people that are waiting for an invitation, they're waiting for somebody to tell them that they have power, that they have a voice, but you already have permission. You have permission and power to tell your story, to make sure that the ideas that you believe in travel, and that you can make this world the world that it deserves to be. It's an honor to be here today. I think we're gonna do questions, and I appreciate seeing all of you today. Thank you. What was that? Perfect. Who has some questions? Here. Uh, hello. I'm Jameer Seagraves from Paul Robeson High School. I wanted to know how did you know Market Street was a, a slave market? Like, I don't know what. Can you repeat it? How did you know Market Street was the slave market? So I went to Montgomery, and in Montgomery, there's an incredible organization called the Equal Justice Initiative, and I toured with them, and they are creating the first uh, public landmarks to lynching in the country. So they've gone around to all the lynching sites in the South, and they've collected dirt from the lynching sites, and they put it up, and they're about to make a lynching museum. But in the tour of downtown Montgomery, I saw, I, I was there. So the Alabama River hits Montgomery, like right downtown, and that's where the slave ships would come in, and slaves would get off. They would walk down Commerce Street, and right, um, right in downtown Montgomery where King's Church is, so it's like the state house is at the top of the hill, the church where King was pastor is right there also at the top, and then at the very bottom is this big circle and it's called Market Street and that's where the slave market was. You think about things like Brooks Brothers, Brooks Brothers, which all of you know is a clothing store, the first uh, people that Brooks Brothers closed were slaves, like the industry of America was built around slavery in so many ways, that the first things that were insured were people, that the insurance industry in this country was built on the backs of slaves. So it's so, many, it's so many things that are important that we think about, but Market Street and Commerce Street, Montgomery is a great example of them. One last question. Um, hello, my name is Mikhail McKinney of Philadelphia Academy Charter School. And my question to you is, what is your view on the immigration ban by Donald Trump? Integration being? The immigration ban. Oh, the immigrant. I thought you said integration. No, I no, 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 no. I said immigration. Uh, immigration. The, the Muslim man. Yeah, it's absurd. I think that one of the things that uh, Trump is doing incredibly well is that he is creating so much chaos all at once that people can't focus. And like, I think that that is like a real, it's a, it's a winning strategy for him right now because it's like you don't know if you should 
protest the confirmation hearings, or if you should be at the airport around the Muslim ban, or if you should be camped out in your senator's office. Like, there's so much going on right now that like people can't focus. I think that the Muslim ban, what worries me about it, not only is it deeply problematic and wrong, but it took people on the other side, like the side of justice and equity, it took people so long, like the people in power to come out and say it was wrong. Uh, and that's a real challenge. I think that I'm, I'm heartened by all the people that went to the airport and all the people that went in the streets. You know, we were out in the streets two, year, two years ago in Ferguson and Baltimore and cities across the country when it wasn't cool to be a protester, right? When it was really hard. I think about the first time I got tear gassed was a long time ago in the movement space or the first time I got hit with the sound cannons or dragged out of a police department by my ankles or all of these things. It was way before protesting was something that is like publicly acceptable. But in this moment, I've seen so many people all of a sudden understand and protest is this beautiful thing about the, American, uh, about the American democracy. So it was beautiful to see people at the airports. You know, this is, day, this is day 12 of the administration, right? We have a long way to go. I'm hoping, I don't know if you saw uh, President Obama and Michelle Obama uh, on vacation, and Obama has like his hat backwards, like he is on vacation chilling. Uh, and I'm hoping that he will get off vacation soon and come back and like help us get out of this. But the Muslim ban, I think, is just going to be the beginning of so many things. It, uh, he's calling for the end of Head Start. I don't know if any of you were ever in Head Start, but Head Start is one of the largest daycare programs for uh, people in poverty and black and brown people. And like the end of that would do devastating things to our communities. So it really is incumbent on all of you to make sure that we are resisting and pushing and organizing in like really incredible ways, because you have a lot of power that when you band together with other people, like that is how resistance works. All right, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you.